It is a push strategy that's really effective. Uh, whereas a story that gives you an in or gives your audience an insight into your character is more of a pull strategy. Uh, it's interesting and it builds rapport. Now, I, I stumbled on this early in my career, and so this is my story about how to use a connection story. Uh, my first job was straight out of uni. Uh, I worked in Mount Isa, flying fly out of Phosphate Hill, working uh, 14 days on, seven day off shift roster. And my, my biggest challenge straight out of research was building a rapport with operators. Now, I was more comfortable with you know, research and study and, and they were more interested in beer and fishing. Um, and so that, that was a really big challenge for me. Um, and, and so I struggled to build that, you know, rapport and personal connection. Now, 10 months in, the company decided that having an asthmatic working at a, a sulfuric acid plant was not a very good idea um, because sulfur dioxide is one of the worst respiratory irritants. And so they moved me back to Sydney. Uh, and so, again, a big change in my life from going from remote Queensland into the, the, the middle of Sydney, basically, working for a big refinery. But despite all those big changes, the, the thing that I dreaded the most was having to start all over again with a bunch of operators, and this time not from two control rooms, but from five. Uh, so first day in, I'm at the utilities control room. The operators are like, who are you? Where are you from? And so I was like, well, I, I'm just moved from Mount Isa. Um, you know, I was there 10 months, and even though I was really enjoying it, I had to move because I'm asthmatic at a sulfuric acid plant, and apparently I should have been told that before I got there. Um, yeah, I was doing a 14-7 roster and fly and fly to Phosphate Hill. And before I even got, you know, really a chance to finish the story, they were like, oh, yeah, I've got a mate that works at Phosphate Hill. Bob, do you know Bob? Um, you know, another guy said, oh, yeah, I, I, I saw those jobs come out, but I decided not to because the money wasn't enough or I didn't like the roster or, you know, all sorts of different reasons. And I walked out of the control room after that discussion thinking, these guys are so much nicer than the ones I met in Mount Isa and Phosphate Hill. And, and then I thought about it a bit more and I thought, actually, no, the thing that's different is not them. The thing that's different is me because what I talked about was different. And, and I talked about things that they were actually, or experiences that, that I had, which were interesting to them. And so it wasn't until 20 years later that I discovered that this actually has a name. And Sean Callahan, who's a Melbourne based business storytelling expert calls it a connection story. Um, that you tell to help build rapport. And so the key things with a connection story uh, is it tells you something about your character and you're not interested in telling people about your achievements and things like that. Uh, you want them to understand you. You want them to feel like, you know, you're, you're a little bit like your audience, even if you've got lots of differences, you, you want them to get a taste of how you're similar. And you want them to feel like you understand their world. And, and that's really, what happened in the control room for me is, you know, I was talking to things that the guys that have had all experienced, you know, remote work, difficult rosters, you know, companies that don't necessarily give them the information they think they should need um, and all those sorts of things. And so, you know, after 15 minutes, instead of struggling to build rapport, I, I felt like I was actually one of the guys. Um, and so, so that's my connection story and I use that now uh, I always draw on my experiences from Mount Isa and Phosphate Hill when I talk to operators because I find that it, it really does help to build a connection. Back to you, Brian. All right. Um, okay. My connection story um, is a university story, uh, being postgraduate studies. Um, and um, I guess the, the theme of my little bit of story here is about check your chemical compatibility and have an emergency plan. So I'll start with that little opening. Um, when I was a research student, um, my colleague uh, that I was doing some work with received some research money to determine uh, aluminium in concentrated sodium hydroxide solutions from a bauxite refinery here in Queensland. Um, we sat down together, and there's no names being mentioned here, by the way, folks, to protect the innocent. Um, <laughs> We sat down, we planned out what we were going to do, we planned out our concentrations, we looked at what we needed, the amounts of materials, how our methodology is going to work, and we thought, okay, we're smart people. We're very smart people, we'll do a little bit of a batch test before we make up all of the solutions we need and see if we can actually get this little bit of analysis um, to work. It was a, a flow-based system. We weren't even sure we could pump the liquid through 
the um, sensor that we were use we were planning to use. So we thought, well, we'll give it a go. Um, so what we decided was that we would um, we would get about four or five liters concentrated uh, steam hydroxide. Um, it had to be obviously pumpable, so it couldn't crystallize out, uh, and it had to be as much as we could get it in a saturated solution as we could get. So therefore, we had to heat the solution and keep it going. However, in our lab, you know, money was not great back in the 1980s. Um, we had trouble finding a vessel that was actually going to hold five litres of, of liquid. Um, we recognised that glassware wasn't a good choice. Um, sodium hydroxide concentrated glassware, you know, not a great choice. So we looked around and eventually we found what we believed was a, a steel pot. Um, we grabbed that, put it on the bench, got our um, hot mixer stirrer, um, put the container on that and... Um, we got it going, mixed it all up, got it going. We thought, right, let's go and have some lunch. Uh, about 45 minutes, an hour or so later, we came back and the lights in the lab were out. And we thought, oh, that's a bit strange. Um, so on approaching our bench, we couldn't find the steel pot anymore. Turns out it wasn't steel, it was aluminium. Oops, aluminium, sodium hydroxide, yeah. Reaction occurred, dissolved, dissolved to the hot bench stirrer as well. Um, dug a big hole in the bench, uh, very fresh wood was exposed, um, and we had this boiling sort of bubbly mess on the floor underneath it. Now, we were really lucky. Um, we didn't really have any cleanup gear. Risk assessments in the 90s was sort of like, oh, yeah, risk assessment. Yeah, people do those things. Um, we didn't actually hurt anyone. There was no fire. The circuit breakers did what they were designed to do. But we did make a terrible mess. It took us ages to clean it up and it took us even longer to hide it. Um, so <laughs> we could have planned for that spill. We could have planned for an electrical issue, but we didn't plan for our pot and we didn't plan for any of it. So my connection story to you guys tonight is keep thinking about those chemical hazards. Keep recognizing where things aren't what you think they are and I learned something um I hope that that story sticks in your mind too um I guess in the absence of Kelly she's probably going to kill me uh given all the hard work we're doing Steve I'll I'll have to come back to yourself oh you're on mute do the right thing and take my put myself on mute and I forget to take, take myself off uh, so, yeah, we'll jump on to talking about story structure now. Uh, so this is probably the lesser interesting bit, but it is actually really important because it turns out that story structure really does affect uh, a couple of things. One, how, how good and how much impact your story has. But there, there's a couple of unexpected benefits from understanding story structure, and I'll talk about that a bit in a sec. So I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that will work. How'd that go? Looks good. Excellent. All right. So anyone can tell a story. So for for example, uh, a story I have is about a guy who who loved boxing ever since he was a teenager, and he would do boxing every single opportunity he got. You know, training, competition, all this kind of stuff. Uh, it must have been fifty years that that he'd spent you know, boxing throughout his life when finally he um, he died of a heart, heart attack in his sleep one night and, and that was it. That was the end of his boxing. Now, now that's a story or maybe, but it's not a good story. So, so what are the components of a good story? Well, I, I think to break it down to be very simple, there's three components. You need to have characters. You need to have some sort of challenge that the, the characters face. And then there needs to be some sort of resolution. How, how does it all turn out? So the characters, a couple of things you need to you need to deal with. You know, what are they like? And, and a key part of, of this beginning and painting the picture is what are they what, what are they trying to do? What's their goal? They must have some sort of intent to achieve something. And importantly as well, then people want to understand 
what do they feel about this? You know, are they, are they, are they feeling angry because they have to do this thing or are they, it's something they passionately want to achieve? And, and so that's the basis for the beginning of the story. Who are the characters? What are they trying to achieve? And how do they feel about uh, what they're doing? Now, the, the second part is the challenge. And so really good stories, there's, there's something unexpected that happens. Now, if you, if you think about a, a famous boxing story that, that's won awards and everyone knows about Rocky, now, when you, you start with a character, so you get a sense of who he is and what's important to him and what, what he wants to achieve in life. And then there's this unexpected thing that happens that turns his, his, uh, his life on its head. And this is an opportunity. He gets an opportunity to, to box the champion. And so now he's got a difficult he's got a difficult decision to make. He's he's got hardships and suffering that, that he'll have to go through. And and you know, he has all sorts of emotions that he goes through. And and, and so this is the second part. You, you're trying to describe you know, what these challenges are and how they respond to them and how they feel. And are they going to rise to this challenge or not? And and you don't you don't know necessarily at this stage. Now, in, interestingly, this second stage is uh, mirrored by the you know the human struggle that we all have. Uh, and if you're familiar with Brené Brown, she talks about uh, when you fail and rising up again. And she talks about the the, the three stages of that. The first stage is is, is the failure um, or, or or the beginning, and then you fail in the second stage. That's that's what she calls day two, when you've you've got to get back up again, hopefully, and recover and rebuild yourself. Uh, and that's the difficult, scary, challenging bit where you don't know where the results are going to be. And she says, if you actually want to grow as a person, you can't skip day two. You can't avoid the difficult, hard situation where you don't know what the answer is, but you have to just get up and start trying again. And, and in storytelling, I think it's the same thing. You can't, you can't skip the section two. If you, you skip section two or day two, then your story is not going to have a lot of impact because it's that challenge and how your character responds to that challenge that really makes the difference. And then finally, you have the resolution. So how did your character respond to the challenge? I remember in, uh, in Rocky, you know, he, he trained like he believed he could win. In fact, I think it was the champion at one stage realizes that, hey, this guy thinks he can win. And then starts to realize that maybe, maybe perhaps he shouldn't have been so casual about all this and, and he should have been training a bit harder as well. You know, how did they feel when they got to the end, when, when, when it was all resolved? And I think the other thing that, that really uh, captures people's attention is how did they change from that experience? You know, was it a good change? Was it a bad change? How, how did they become different? And so I, I find that if you stick to those steps there, there you, can, you can start to build quite an engaging and uh, an emotional engaging story, which is what makes it really sticky. Now, understanding story structure not only helps you create good stories, but it actually has unexpected benefits. And one of those is that understanding story structure has been shown to dramatically improve reading comprehension. So there was a researcher that did a study that took a bunch of students and graded them from advanced to the below average, and then took the below average students and gave them some fairly simple training on story structure. And then they tested all the students again and discovered to their surprise that the below average students started to outperform the advanced students in reading comprehension. Now that has really significant implications, I think, when it comes to you know, helping people comprehend safety information such as risk assessments uh, or, you know, data sheets and that sort of thing. Because this study showed that the reading comprehension was not limited or the improvement was not limited to stories, but to any written information. And, and so even technical information, if you understand story structures, somehow that helps you understand other types of written information as well. So understanding story structure will help you uh, build uh, better and more engaging stories, but it also helps with reading comprehension. And so you can, you can use that in your teams uh, to, to get other benefits as well. So I'll hand back to you now, Brian. Right, thanks, Steve. That was um, 
really really good um because i think i think as you say the structure is important you must have a point to your story it must mean something to someone and of course it being funny it being painful uh, a bit like tonight's story which i'm going to learn a lot from um you may need to do a little bit more planning to ensure that you're in the right place so <laughs> um so um i've got a second story to uh to share with you um and um this story is about uh preparedness um not like this evening um i um became the first aid um and hsr hso huzo for a chemical laboratory that i was working um with uh here in brisbane um and um my thought process was around paying for as many accidents that as that I could. Um, and, you know, all the obvious ones, things in the eyes, cut scratches, all that sort of thing. Um, so that I would have a thorough approach to, to managing people who are injured. Um, now, of course, you can't plan for everything. Um, some things catch you out. And that is the point of this story. There's a bit at the end which catches me out and surprised me. Um, okay, so I volunteered to be the workplace health and safety officer and the first aid officer. I received my statutory training and I kind of started working on emergency plans and, and those sorts of things. Um, and it was a big challenge because there was a culture in the laboratory of, well, nothing can really go wrong here. What are we worried about? We haven't had any accidents, et cetera, et cetera. So not long after I got some basic plans in place, and remember this is the late 90s, um, so again, things were not as probably pressed upon people now in terms of safety, but um, I see a lot of improvements. Um, so one of my first experiences was a worker in our laboratory somehow or other managed to break a glass pipette in the middle of a transfer, and in breaking it, they flicked the solvent in such a way that it actually went somehow around their safety glasses, which they did have on, into their eyes. And we weren't even sure whether the glass went with the liquid. Um, I can't remember the exact, it was a solvent, so I think it might have been acetone or something, so immediately it started to burn like hell. She was reasonably calm. I've got something in my eye. <laughs> Everyone came across. We applied some first aid, we calmed down a bit. Uh, we immediately um, looked at how we were going to get to the hospital. Now, the laboratory I was working in was only a few minutes away from the Royal Brisbane Hospital. So uh, we made the decision very rapidly. We weren't gonna ring an ambulance and wait maybe 10 minutes because it's not, it wasn't a, uh, a serious injury in terms of she's not bleeding out. Uh, let's get her in the car. We'll just go straight to the hospital. Um, we grabbed the SDS for the material uh, and we also, one of the people, uh, one of our lab people rang the hospital and said, hey, listen, we've got someone coming, they've got something in their eye, we don't know what it is, and they faxed the, they faxed, and that's a word you haven't heard in a long time, they faxed the SDS to the hospital. When we arrived, they were waiting for us. They collected us at the entry, she was put on a bed, um, they dyed her eye to make sure there was no glass in it, thankfully no glass. Uh, Brian, of course, is standing around uh, watching this, wondering what he's actually supposed to do at this point in time. Um, and uh, then they hooked up a saline, saline bag to her and they put a little cup in her eye and basically just washed the eye through with a bag of saline. Now, this was going to take probably around 50 to 60 minutes. So in the meantime, I rang her husband and gave him the news he needed to come to the hospital. He was a bit shocked, unsurprisingly, but... Uh, as I explained to him, all I knew at that point in time was she was okay uh, and they were flushing the eye. Now, the saline in one of these things basically runs into the cup in your eye, it fills the cup and then it runs out of your eye and because you're lying down, it runs through your hair. Now, for most people, eh, no big deal. However, this lady's hair was dyed red. And so the saline basically extracted the red colour from her hair and washed it onto the um, uh, table that she was lying on and then formed a great big puddle on the floor underneath her, um, 
her um, bed. About 30 minutes into this, the husband came in. He was already looking pale and concerned. And the first thing he saw when he walked in the door was his wife lying on the bed with a big puddle of red underneath her head. And I seriously thought he was going to faint and I was going to have another patient on my hand. We got him calmed down as well. We explained what, was, what it was and it kind of went really well. And then I was able to leave. So what went well? We applied the first day. We got the person efficiently to the hospital. Um, and as far as I recall, and I've, I've met this young lady at a couple of places since then, um, her eyesight is fine. I'm not sure about her husband's heart. It might have a condition attached to it now. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Um, unfortunately, I can't pass to Kelly because she's still missing in action. So Steve, I guess it's back to yourself. Microphone. Are you there, Steve? We lost Steve. Looks like he's frozen. Ah. Send him a message. disappeared. Uh, he may have stepped out and tried to come back in. We might be an hour behind, but our uh, internet uh, access has been a little bit flaky up here. Maybe try giving Steve a ring. Yep. <clears throat> Unfortunately, webinars are live events. There's not a lot we can do about it. Uh, I'm sure he'll come back in. I'll just ring him. Oh, I can see his labels come back up there. Uh, it's on hold. Yep, so I can't get Steve. Um, hmm, challenges, guys. More challenges than I expected. I've got to say that. <laughs> Webinars. Yes. I thought seminars were a challenge. Getting the catering right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing missing from webinars. Um, yeah, it's a thing you don't have to worry about as much. Yeah. It's a learning curve for everyone. <laughs> um, is he come? No, he's flicking in and out. So he's obviously got a problem at his end. All right. Um, okay. So um, maybe what I'll do while we're trying to get Steve back on is I'll give you my last story for the evening. Um, and um, the thesis for this story is about, well, what could have been done better? So the last story was really about um, oh, I've just got a message from him. Uh, he's not sure what the issue is. Um, okay, I will keep going. All right. So um, the last story was really about things that went wrong. Okay. Oh, sorry, that went right. So we planned uh, and and. Um, most of the story went right. We couldn't have planned for the husband's response. I could never have imagined that, that we would have this huge pool of red stuff under that lady's head. The second one, or my third story for the evening is, is really about what could have been done better. And it relates to testing equipment. I see that safety is, is sometimes about assumptions. People make assumptions about things. They think, oh yes, I've got this plan, it should work. But until you actually test the plan, you never really um, actually know whether your plan will work. So this story is about testing your emergency equipment. Now, we've all got showers in our laboratories, I hope. 
and we've just been through a big thing with standards, I think, on showers. Um, and thanks to, to Neil and Lisa to, to keeping that one um, going. So let's get into this story. Picture this. You have two six foot two regulators who are inspecting a chemical batching plant. All right, so that's myself and one of my colleagues. Now, previously we had talked to the operator about um, safety showers. And one of the things that we'd observed is that where his workers actually load all the chemicals into the mixing um, um, vessel, the safety shower was probably a good 60 meters away from them. Now, that's where they're going to get exposed. So, um, we uh, offered him a chance rather than giving him a, a, a couple of notices to resolve the issue. Um, as, that's as far as I remember anyway. So um, we gave him a couple of months and we came back and we're standing next to this brand new shiny shower with shiny connections. Um, and the operator was very proud of the safety shower. Um, and so he should be, it was positioned well. He'd thought through quite a substantial number of the accidents. So my colleague asked the obvious question, can I test this shower? And the operator said, yeah, sure, you can test the shower. So picture in your mind, and I guess most of us have tested a safety shower at one stage or another in our careers, you get wet. And there is no way around it, you do get wet. So my colleague reaches up, he pulls the, um, the shower handle down and, um, huge amount of waters comes out. So we're all beaming and quite happy about this little thing and it seems to do the job and there's water going everywhere. So my colleague just releases the handle and the valve slams shut. Now, if you know about safety showers, the water supply to safety showers is quite a large pipe. The pipe bursts at the connection point, uh, then lifts up in the air and starts flopping around like a hose because he hadn't quite tied it down. Um, and my colleague gets absolutely drowned. I get drowned. Well, not as much as him. That was quite funny. Um, and of course, the operator, the owner of this particular chemical plant gets drowned as well. So just imagine for a moment what could have gone wrong there and what could the operator have done or this, this chemical batching plant operator done to check. Imagine that the person that you're dealing with is covered in an acidic chemical and they're standing under the shower trying to get their clothes off because it's what you do. You need to get your clothes off to remove the chemicals away from your skin. He lets go of the shower for a second or she lets go of the shower for a second and the water flow stops and the hose bursts. That person won't get the protection that they need. So when you build your emergency plan for a chemical hazard or when you build a, or put in a piece of equipment test it and test it like you're going to use it and that's the best way to do it so i see that steve is back online is that correct let me just make him a panelist yep <clears throat> anyway it was a good win for the owner because he fixed the problem and as far as i know he's never had to use the shower in anger let me tell you one of my stories yeah, please, that'd be great, Neil. I had the situation, Brian, similar to yours. There's me, I'm a snotty-nosed PhD student. I've just graduated with my shiny piece of paper and just yappy, I'm the lad, I can do all this stuff. And I'm really, you know, I've got this, just started this research degree and I'm really confident and competent that I can do all these things fantastically. And there I am in the first year lab, preparing all these solutions of dimethyl sulfoxide and carbon tetrachloride, dissolving pieces of metal and um, preparing these beautiful new complexes. And isn't it wonderful? And <clears throat> isn't it the most fantastic thing? And I'm showing all my crystals around to everywhere. And of course I have to get rid of these solutions into a container, okay? And it's dimethyl sulfoxide, dimethyl formamide, dimethyl acetamide, and carbon tetrachloride. Carb and of course, these things dissolve metal. And of course, me being the young, naive student I did, I've got this really big 44 gallon drum made of 
Oh, it's iron. It's, they weren't lined in those times. And mm -hmm. over the next three years, I'm pouring my, well, 25 mil of reactant solution into this. And it's the time, oh, it's full. We better arrange for it to be taken away, you know. And um, guess what happens when we try to lift it up? The <laughs> bottom falls out. <laughs> The bottom falls out, corrosion, me being the academic, not realizing that this stuff actually corrodes, not just little pieces of metal I'm putting into it, but it corrodes the big cylinder as well. So we had about an inch deep of these horrible organic solvents all on the lab. And they, um, of course, take the whole shine off the wooden floor and they have to resurface the floor as well as get rid of all the solvent. And um, this is a story of, um, you know, this is normal life. You as a new research student, find these things that teach you something, i.e. listen to everyone around you and don't think you've got the biggest ego under the sun, you know? <laughs> so I guess that's one of my stories. And that's where I started learning about safety and started really getting into safety in labs and started getting into, well, how do we keep people safe? How does this stop happening? Have we got any standards? And my next, my next thing was to move to Australia and to work for CSIRO, but that's another story in itself. Okay, so um, uh, Steve, Steve is back. Steve is back. Steve Sorry is for the for the seventeenth time. Um, hopefully, hopefully my internet works now. <laughs> um, I, I I caught the end of that story, and 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 it, I, I think it actually illustrates a, a really interesting phenomenon with stories and that is if you tell a story someone will tell straight away usually a similar story mm. and so it's something you can use to find things out like if you want to know what people think about or a certain safety subject you just have to tell a story about that and then people will just start telling stories um, around that subject and, it, and often that's actually much more effective than asking people questions about what they think or you know what happened you just tell a story and then you just get all the stories back and you go oh okay <laughs> that's interesting would never have got that if I had have asked what went on that's right so um so hopefully hopefully I, I got that correct it sounded like a similar story to the one that Brian told at the start yep almost yeah. almost identical uh, yeah. in its in its Thought through, but not quite. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's the point I'm trying to make in that youngsters don't quite get it. It's the experience of time that mm. builds our ability to think in a broader context. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and that, was, that was influential when I started in, in research as well. Uh, you know, similar, you know, in the 90s. I, mean, we, I think we did do a risk assessment or there was one. I, I can't remember any details from it at all. But we were using concentrated HF. Uh, but what I do remember clearly is the story about a guy who got HF on his leg. He spilled HF on his leg. Uh, and he, he knew this was a bad thing. So he ran and called the ambulance. And then once he'd got the ambulance and given the details and all this sort of stuff, he, he went and ran in the pool. So I, I don't know what he was doing at HF near a pool, but, uh, you know, so he knew, he knew he had to get this stuff off him. But he actually ended up dying because not from the corrosion or the burns, but from fluoride poisoning about a week later. Yeah. Because what he should have done is he should have washed off straight away and then called the ambulance. So he did the right things. He just did them in the wrong order and it cost him his life. And that story was told to me as a, you know, just out of my undergrad degree, just starting to research in the lab. And that's what, that's what, that's what stuck with me for 20 years. You know, you need to be very careful with HF, but if you get it on you, there's all sorts of things you need to do, but you got to wash it off first. <laughs> and I always remember that. Unfortunately, I didn't have to use that information, but the story stuck in my mind. If that was on a risk assessment, I do not remember. And so stories or making sure people remember crucial information is so much better. Yeah. Okay. So much better. Um, now, if it's okay, um, I can jump in and start talking about 
you know, some of the things that, some of the reasons why stories are so powerful. Yes, please. Yeah. Hopefully I can get through this before my internet fails again. And we, 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 yeah, so I've given all my stories now, Steve. Oh, and there I've you tried, go. I've, I've tried to make the linkage between the, the story structure and what we should do more of and what we need to improve. And maybe if Kelly does actually catch us up, we can grab some of her stories as well. Yeah, that'd be great. It'd be, <laughs> she has some, some really useful stories. Uh, so it would be a real shame to miss it. Um, yeah, so, so why is it that stories are so powerful? Well, firstly, uh, Professor Robin Dunbar from Oxford University, and, and these tend to be sociologists and psychologists, not, not um, you know, safety people that, that have discovered these things. He, he actually showed that most of your casual conversation is made up of stories. And so we actually naturally communicate in story form. And so if, if you want to insert information into a conversation the most natural way, well, the story form is actually the most natural way for you to do it. And, and so that makes it a really useful tool uh, for, for giving people information. Now, Another professor, Roger Shank, and he taught at Stanford and Yale, he says this, if you want people to remember something, tie it to the plot of a story. Now, the reason for this is because learning is, learning is optimal when it's linked with existing knowledge, which seems pretty obvious, right? But existing knowledge is stored in the brain as stories, and those stories are constructed around past experiences. And so that's why it's so powerful to link learning with stories. Uh, and Professor Michael Dalstrom also reported that in direct comparison to expository text, narrative te text was read twice as fast. Now I'm just going to see if I'm going to share my screen here. This is very hard to see. <coughs> share screen. Just add some pictures. So information in stories is absorbed much faster as well. And so read, read twice as fast and then in fact recalled twice as well. So if you think about that, that gives actually a four factor advantage uh, over just presenting people with information facts or even a a logical or what you think is a compelling argument. Stories will actually even be more effective than that by orders of magnitude. And, and this effect was shown to be true regardless of whether the person listening was familiar or interested in the content. So it really is a powerful way of, of getting people to remember and to be able to recall information. Now, the, there's another effect that, that happens and, and the references are at the end of this presentation, which you'll get. When you tell a story, the brain patterns in the person listening mirror your brain patterns. And what that means is it's much more likely that they'll understand your intent, uh, your meaning, or, or, or even what you're actually wanting them to do. This effect does not happen when you give people facts or if you give them a logical argument. It only happens when you're telling a story. Now, in addition to this, uh, there's another professor, Paul Zach showed that emotionally engaging narratives actually have a biological effect. And when you hear one of these, you actually release oxytocin into the brain. So you can actually inject chemical into someone's brain by telling them a good story. Now, oxytocin, you probably know, is that feel-good chemical which uh, causes you to have uh, concern for the characters in the narrative. It, it, you're more likely to have some sort of connection with the, with the teller because of this. And it also inspires post-narrative actions. Now, this, this is a crucial fact because this is something that other forms of communication or providing information do not do. In fact, one of the few things that reliably inspire people to do something is stories. Now, okay, so just to, to sum up, I guess, the the concept of stories and what they do. Uh, stories are durable memory. So sorry, durable memories are pictures and, and the memory experts hold them to hold these together with emotion. That's the best way to, to remember a string of things is pictures connected by emotion. Uh, now stories are just pictures held together by some sort of plot and emotion. So, you know, you can see how, how they're such a powerful memory tool. Now, 
We've seen information in stories as it's all faster and recalled quicker. Uh, they help to create connection and empathy and inspire action, convey accurate meaning. And most casual conversation is made of stories. So if, if you want to actually put information into a conversation, the stories is actually the easiest way to do that. And then one thing I haven't talked about is a safety story. Well, it's just simply a story with a safety message. A story is just, you know, a fun anecdote. Uh, it doesn't really have any purpose other than to entertain or inform or, or, or put yourself in good light. Uh, if you want to tell a safety story, you have to have a safety message that goes with the story. So the, the way you think about safety stories is actually the opposite way around. You have to think about the message that you want people to understand and then select a story that reinforces that message. So that's, that's the bit that I think makes safety storytelling or, or storytelling with a message more difficult because you actually have to fit the story to the message. You can't just pick a cool story that you think will, uh, will impress people. Now the story backbone, you can, you, know, you can use the same story for any audience. You can just tailor the story, the information, the detail uh, to suit your audience. So a lot of the chemistry stories today have lots of chemi chemistry detail that, that you know, someone who works in the office and hasn't studied chemistry won't understand. But you can still tell Brian's story about the pot that dissolves, but the person doesn't need to know it was caustic and aluminium if it's not going to mean anything to them. But they will still get... Uh, the message about you know planning and knowing how to respond uh, and so so that's it for me there, that that's uh, in a nutshell uh, the power of stories and and why they are so useful for um, getting information in people's heads and Kelly, Kelly has arrived oh awesome fantastic so, let me apologize to Kelly in that the time zone was not correct and oh, um, right. we started an hour early because Melbourne, you're a, you're a, you're an hour, well, yeah. you're an hour different from us. <laughs> uh, we we stuff this up merrily and happily. Oh. Um, so, so we've made for a very very relaxed presentation, Kelly. So um, perhaps I can introduce to you finally, um, <laughs> Dr. Kelly. Grove. <laughs> My apologies, I thought I was on time. <laughs> um, well, uh, just a quick aside, I had a telephone conversation with Neil and said, I'll see you in about two hours. He went, no, I'll see you in 15. And I, I put the phone down and was driving along thinking, what do you meant by that? <laughs> so um, I didn't read my message. It's a story in itself. So, um, <laughs> Thank, thanks, Kelly, for, for joining us. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and, and tell your story? Um, and then perhaps one of your other stories. Um, <laughs> and, and we'll wind up the evening uh, as best we can. Yeah. Oh, my, my, well, my apologies for, um, for being late. I'm sorry about that. I didn't realise. No, I... Um, no, 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 neither did we. You don't have to apologise. <laughs> <laughs> so my, um, my introduction to, to safety was actually when I was a PhD student. And, and I think it's been my experience that people that have gone on to be involved in safety have in some way um, been touched by a, a safety story during their career. And they tend to have a lot of buy-in in, in safety issues thereafter because it's, it's affected them personally. Um, and so... My introduction was a, a very memorable day um, for two reasons. I, I was involved in a safety incident and, and secondly, my future husband asked me out on a date. Um, and so the, the safety story though, is that uh, as a beginning PhD student, I was doing a reaction uh, that we had risk assessed using our uh, reaction sheets as, as we called them. Um, and it was a two-step reaction involving an intermediate uh, that was unstable. Um, and then I was, so what I was making was a sugar azide um, and the intermediate was a sugar bromide. Um, the solvent used for the, the first step was DCM and the solvent used for the second step was DMF and you heat it with sodium azide. So I did the reaction um, and you don't really work up, well, you work up the second step, um, but you carry it straight through. Um, so I did the, the final step is where you concentrated in vacuo um, on a, using a high vacuum pump to remove the DMF and, and water. Um, and then I turn off the back vacuum and allowed it to defrost, um, thinking that I would come and empty the trap the following day. 
uh, and the following day comes along and we had a student um, in the lab that wanted to also use the equipment and she said oh look I'll empty the trap um, you know what is it and I said oh it's DMF and water um, and I was five minutes away from doing this myself she just sort of beat me to it um, and anyway as she opened the glass trap um, it detonated is the only word I can use to describe it it was the loudest bang I have ever heard um, and everyone is in shock from the from the, the noise alone but the, the poor student did get glass shards in her her face um, and her hands and it went through her lab coat um, so she had some some lacerations um, and uh, so she you know we treated we treated that and we went through our normal procedures of calling for first aid which at that stage was the security staff who were all first aid trained um, and so we treated her initial injuries waiting for the ambulance to arrive and the security guard offhandedly not really thinking about what he was saying said oh heads are going to roll from this incident and of course then this poor student went into shock um, and so then we had the situation of now having to manage the shock as part of the first aid procedure as well as her her injuries so she was taken to hospital and um, and look she made a full recovery she did she did go home later that day which was good um, and very very lucky mm. um, it was an extreme explosion we had glass embedded in the ceiling um, and you know look the, the regulator was called and we it was investigated by workplace health and safety Queensland it was my first time as a you know a new PhD student answering you know <laughs> being interviewed by the regulator and, and answering questions um, and they made a few recommendations but on the whole they were fairly happy that this was not foreseeable and and we didn't you know couldn't have really anticipated this side reaction so um, there was a safety note in our eventual publication on it so we hopefully pass on that information um, but um, I guess the positive that came out of the whole day apart from it being a very uh, upsetting day was that my, my husband asked me out on a date and, and he likes to now recount the story that he got me at a weak moment so um, but there was a positive out of the whole thing and that was it um, oh. that was my introduction to safety <laughs> and it that's was, a great uh, sorry that's a great story Kelly <laughs> <laughs> yeah on retrospect but at the time it was definitely a uh, career changing it made me reevaluate um, what I was doing and um and I got a lifelong interest in safety, I guess, as a, as a result. Yeah. 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 So un, an unexpected learning leads to a, a career. And I think that that's something that, you know, um, is, um, is really important to us all. We, we learn things as we go along. I guess what we're aiming for is to not get hurt while we learn. Them. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. At least not being a permanent injury. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, in any injury is a bad one, but you have to wear some scars of some sort, mental or physical, I think, mm. to, to actually learn things. And I'll, I'll go with Neil's little story as well. I was pretty sure of myself when I started at uni, thinking I could do whatever. It turns out I was wrong. Um, that's the other lesson, but anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, we're kind of reaching the end of our time. Would you like to share one more story with us, Kelly, and then we can ask some questions, get some questions from the group? Yeah, well, I, um, I might go with the, uh, the sodium story, just because I think it's potentially more entertaining. Um, Is that the one with the flamethrower? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so we, uh, we had... Um, yeah, so in, I guess, you know, and safety professionals often uh, look at this as when you have lots of little failures adding up to cause a bigger incident than would have happened if you just had a small failure. Um, and so we had um, an example of this, um, and it was also an example of our emergency response not being great. Um, and so the, the example was that we had a reasonably experienced PhD student working with sodium. Um, they'd finished working with the sodium and they went, they quenched it, or so they thought. Um, and so they thought they'd quench the sodium. Um, but often what happens is you have maybe quenched the material on the outside, but a little bit on the inside has unreacted. It's not, it's not yet reacted. So there was not enough agitation, for example. Um, but they were working on a very small scale. They thought they'd quenched it. Um, and then they then took it to the sink to wash the glassware. Um, and unfortunately, the design of these things is such that they have a very narrow um, uh, drain point. Um, and they, this particular drain point was clogged with broken glassware. 
Um, and so the other thing that happens at our sinks is that they'll rinse um, glassware with small amounts of acetone and then they're normally meant to dilute this a lot with water at the same time. Um, and obviously this hadn't been happening as well as it should have. And so what had happened is the sink had clogged up and then the, um, the sink was full of one centimetre layer of acetone. So the student takes their glassware with unquenched sodium and uh, rinses it into a sink full of acetone basically and the acetone ignites. Um, and so at that point, um, the um, nearby acetone bottle, the vapour trail from that then ignited. And so we then had an acetone squirt bottle that was a flamethrower. Um, and so at this point, they've got a sink that's on fire and an acetone flamethrower beside them. And they're thinking, oh, how do I extinguish it? So um, they could have reached behind them and grabbed the fire blanket and thrown that over the, the fire to smother it. But instead, they decided to, to cut their hands under the tap and try and douse it with water, <laughs> which was not the best strategy. <laughs> Um, so eventually the fire did self-extinguish and no one was hurt in the process. Um, but it's an example of where if they if they properly quenched the sodium, um, we wouldn't have had the fire. If the sink hadn't have been blocked, we wouldn't have had the fire. If the sink hadn't have been full of acetone, we wouldn't have had the fire. Um, and so, and if, if they knew how to, to put out a fire, it would have been a lot less um, of an event. So all of these things combined to actually give us um, yeah, this, this fire in the lab. Um, and uh, so it was a near miss, um, but now that the, our lovely white sink has got this permanent scorch mark on it, it's a constant reminder to the lab occupants of what can go wrong. <laughs> So I like to look at it like that and think that we should never take away that scorch mark because it's a reminder. <laughs> I mute myself. Thanks, Kelly. That was great. I love that story. I can, I can picture in my mind the acetone bottle with the flamethrower effect. Basically, the bottle, you know, the area is getting hotter, so the, the vapour pressure is increasing and then you're getting more and more as time goes by. It sounds like a right... Uh, disaster so okay thank thank you very much Kelly um I guess um I'll throw to our participants to to um to uh ask us some questions if you have any folks um so just unmute yourself and ask away no dead silence ah hmm Nothing from anybody. No one wants to ask us anything. Okay. It's, it's all quiet, but I, I guess as a comment, <clears throat> it's what I have found very useful in training, whether is taking incidents and dissecting them and looking to reinforce that this is what happened, this is what should have happened and, and how we can actually prevent it is a very good reinforcement because one of the things I hear a lot of the time are, well, it hasn't happened to me or it hasn't happened in the organisation, therefore it will never happen. And it's sort of like, mm, no, wrong. And I must admit, Kelly, I, I like the flamethrower one. That's, that's, that's out there. <laughs> I, I enjoyed all of these stories and while you were making telling the stories I was writing down some of the things that happened to me because I've been around for many years and uh, when as a research student uh, doing my doctorate we managed to flood the head of the department's office which was directly under our laboratory which wasn't a particularly good thing to do um, we had a condenser which we ran all the time and unfortunately uh, the tube, the pipe came off the tap and uh, for some unaccountable reason the tap was actually pointing upwards rather than downwards into the sink and so there was a spray which then went through the floor and uh, uh, didn't do uh, the uh, professor, the head of the department, uh, uh, his library much good, um, his office much good. Then there was a time when I was works manager and we were had a very small sulfuric acid uh, plant and we managed to blow the end off the sulfur burner, which uh, wasn't a particularly good thing to do. Uh, same plant, we uh, managed to uh, convert a small trickle of uh, sulfuric acid into 
a gushing torrent. And I'll tell you if you've got a few hours how that happened. Uh, but you learn from all of these things, you see. And the, another time, most unfortunate, where we did what we thought was all the right things to disconnect a pipe from a, a pump and, uh, you know, blanket off and so on. But unfortunately, the fellow who was working on the, the fit who was working on the pipe still got a face full of caustic soda, which was really most unfortunate. Then there was the time when we, uh, yes, we, we decided for some unaccountable reason, I had a, a chemi young chemical engineer working for me and we were blowing air through a uh, tank of uh, phosphoric acid. And he decided that it was rather inefficient just to blow air through a tank of uh, phosphoric acid. What we needed to do was to increase the surface area. And he had the bright idea of putting glass marbles in this tank, which seemed good. They seemed to sink to the bottom. But unfortunately, when you had the air blowing through, the glass marbles came out and then went into the inlet of a pump. And we then had crushed glass in our food grade phosphoric acid. So the scones that were made from that were a bit crunchy. That year. <laughs> um, didn't do the colour much good. Then there was the time when we would, we decided, we got the contract to coat a floor. The, the, you know the um, Avalon, the Royal Australian Aircraft uh, um, hangar there where they were housing the new, is it the F-18 or something? This is going back, you know, 20, 30 years. And we had mm. a, a contract to coat the floor with a, uh, uh, a particular chemical resistant uh, moisture cured um, um, polyurethane. Now the problem was, that in order to get the top coat to stick on the, the first coat, you had to get it to cure just a little bit, but not too much. And we got the temperature wrong and the humidity wrong. So we put the first coat down and came back the next day and found it had all cured and that the top coat wouldn't stick on it. So we then had to go around trying to scuff up the, the, the base coat to put the top coat on. So as I said, it's been most enjoyable uh, uh, seminar because it's meant that I've thought of all the things or some of the things that have happened to me over many years. I haven't talked about the time when I was in sales and we had various eccentric customers, uh, one of whom who kept a loaded revolver in his desk in case anyone threatened to put the price up and uh, uh, the same customer actually entertained us on one occasion to, he had a, a, an expert trumpeter on his staff who insisted that he brought his trumpet up and entertained us suppliers uh, with a trumpet uh, concert, which seemed a bit, I say, it's interesting all the, uh, the uh, eccentric and uh, strange people that you meet in the chemical industry. It, it is, and, I, and, and I, can share, I can share a gun story with you as well, Richard. That brought back the same guy that did the safety shower. When I did audits with him, I used to have my notebooks and my information on his gun safe in his office. So <laughs> I, I, I never really understood what the way your customer was, but this customer was a South Australian customer. So uh, yours was, was he? In Queensland, I'm afraid. So yeah. Oh, well. All right, folks. Um, have we got any other questions? Does anybody else want to have a chat? Um, yeah, can, can I can I just tell a little, little story, Adrian here? Uh, I'll just put myself on on um, on on video. Hang on. Um, we can see you. Oh, good. Let's go. Look. Yeah. Briefly, it was it was when I I, I joined uh, Shell. Went, went to the Clyde Refinery, and I was working in the laboratory there. And they always said they said the worst thing you can do in a refinery is to have a fire. That that is the worst thing. And and they in fact even had their own their own um, f uh, fire service that operated within the refinery. To, to at least sort of try to, you know, be the first port of call. Uh, in the process, I actually managed to burn myself, but not with not with fire, but with um, with a molten salt. And as a result of that, uh, I then had to get up at a um, at uh, at the monthly meeting and stand up and tell everybody, uh, you know, about forty people, what happened to me. And the the experience was so humiliating; it really burned on my brain. And like I said, I didn't have a fire. I, I had a molten salt, but it was it was just a real, really good example of how to really get that message across. It is. Yeah. It is. We pay. We pay for our mistakes. Sorry, Kelly. No. Well, I was just going to um, add that often we, as scientists, often tell these stories over a beer, 
Um, and so there's so many things that come out and you think, you know, there's nothing on the record about this happening or this happening. And I think it's because there is this stigma. People are embarrassed. And so I think the more we talk about it, the more we destigmatize, um, you know, what can go wrong and that people feel empowered to come forward and, and, and tell their stories. But I was going to add the refinery one. I used to work at Caltex refinery at Lytton years ago and I was a, um, a brand new graduate and I remember we had a stop work safety meeting in the control room which is like a big concrete bunker um, and it was the middle of summer and we're all dressed to head and tail and you know long long sleeve and long trousers because it's a refinery and there's a fire risk um, and there was not very it was wasn't very well ventilated um, and so we're all standing up for for ages dehydrated and I passed out. <laughs> and so I did it in the right place because it was the control room and they're all first aid trained. So I had first aiders on me in seconds. And as soon as I passed out, I was fine because the blood obviously got back to my brain. Um, but that was it. That was the end of the stop work meeting, which was meant to go on for hours. So I was notorious then. As, and it was only, it was my first week too, as the, as the girl that basically made everyone go back to work because <laughs> they shut down the stop work meeting. Uh, so it was funny because I had operators coming up to me in the car park thereafter always saying, oh, you're the girl that passed out. Uh, oh, that's a great story. Um, okay, so in the theme of what Steve was telling about, I've got a similar one. I, um, I did some work for Lee Australia in 2009. The plaque's still up on the wall as a safety person. Um, and in front of all the volunteers, there was 400 of them. Um, I was asked to give a lecture on hydration because it was going to be hot and people needed to drink. And they gave me this about two minutes before I was supposed to do my safety brief. And I went, oh dear. So at every stop I then made as I went and did my rounds and looking at things, I got known as the piss man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's stuck. And it's been over 10 years now. And some of those people I have met <laughs> still refer to me as the piss man. All right, um, if no one else has got, um, that's a bad note to finish this uh, seminar on, I've got to say, um, and I'm not gonna tell you any more embarrassing accident stories that I've had, because I've had a few more. Um, I'd really, if there are no more questions out there or nothing, nobody else wants to, to share anything. Any, any, any questions about the, the science of, of storytelling? Here yeah, to be very um, positive good way of getting a tale across and a message across and something people will remember yeah and, and that 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 is one of the crucial powers is that once you've told the story they can't forget it and so when you attach the information to the story they can't forget the information either <laughs> so that's one of the one of the tricks for making sure people remember things tell tell the story first and then capture their attention and then just tack on the bits of information you really want people to remember. Would you be happy to share your slides with this group of people, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. I, I prepared them with, with that, that intention. And at the, the last slide has, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll just put them up and show you. The last slide has a bunch of references. So if you, if you want to know a lot more about storytelling than me, uh, read those books and then mission accomplished. So, um, there's some real, that last one there, story proof, the science behind the startling power story. If you really want to get into the science behind it and you know what, what is the most effective story and how they know this to be true, that's, that's the book to read. Uh, if, you, if you're more of the younger generation inclined in the videos on the right might be, um, might be more to your taste. Thank you, Steve, that's appreciated. All right then, well, um, firstly, a big thank you to Steve Kenny uh, and Neon Vita. Um, uh, his contact details were on the slide. So if you've got further questions about storytelling, um, please contact him. Um, and um, he and his consultancy can help you out with stuff there. Um, I'd like to thank Neil um, for uh, helping organize this and make sure we actually sort of got this started, even though the time was slightly incorrect. Um, I really appreciate that text message, Neil, because I would be just warming my hands up about 10 minutes ago going, right, we're into it. And no one would have been here. Um, so great story for me, learning for me.
first webinar, okay, Brian, we'll learn some more things as we go. You never stop. And that's the main part of learning. That is the whole um, thing we've learned tonight, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And uh, okay, we, we pulled it together. So I thank you for that, Neil. Um, Kelly, uh, any final words and a big, huge thank you for your two fastly de fast delivered stories. <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It has been a very interesting pathway. I think it's it's really key the the message that Stephen's putting across there in terms of the art of telling the story. And whilst we will normally go through the same processes of you know going through what we what, you know the, the case review basically, that this this uh, informal way of communicating um, incidents is is powerful. I think, and it's that we already do it as human beings. So you know, why not practice more of it? put it to good use yeah. yeah yeah all right okay so thanks kelly um thank you steve um also thanks to the royal australian chemical institute and the hsc for uh supporting this uh diverse idea um and of course you good folks out there who have come along and and listened to us for an hour and a little bit i hope you've had a great night um if you have any further questions or if you'd like to make any comments on the seminar uh, you can flick Stephen or myself uh, an email um, and take care and good night. Thank you very much.